Hey guys, Andy back here from Mediocre Hobbies, bringing you the first of my monster tutorials. Um, these tutorials are not going to be all based around monsters, they're more about the, the centerpieces of armies, those large scale miniatures. Um, and what I want to try and do is dispel the myth um, that these miniatures are somehow harder to paint than other models. That's just not the case. Um, it breaks my heart to think of all the different people out there who look at a stunning model on a shelf, think I would love to own that miniature, but if I took it at home, I wouldn't be able to do it justice, so I'm not gonna bother getting it. So in line with that, the miniature that I've chosen for in my first video is the new Crow Boys Vulture. As you can see, this model is beyond stunning, but it does look like it's quite a complicated miniature, loads of different parts, loads of different textures, and it will be quite difficult to do. By the end of this video, I'm gonna show you that, that is not the case. Um, you'll be able to get this to a fantastic tabletop standard, something that you'll be proud to bring to a gaming session um, and show off in front of your friends. So stick around at the end, see if you manage to pull that off. Um, and yeah, enjoy the video. Okay, so we're going to start with the priming of the miniature. So because I'm going to be leaning heavily on contrast paints for this, I'm going to do my typical all over black spray and then a Zenith spray of Gracier. So as you can see here, I'm going quite heavy with the black spray on the base. That's because I've used a lot of like loose materials for the basic material, a lot of big stones and like gravelly style stuff. And a really thick coat of black spray really helps to harden that all up and lock it in so bits don't fall off. As you can see, I've built up the vulture to be a little bit taller than he was normally. Um, this is to make him a little bit more imposing on the battlefield. Um, and another reason I do it is so when other miniatures um, uh, are like attacking him or fighting him in a game, so models are piled up around his base, they're not touching off my model with the paint job. I don't want them scratching in wings or his tail or anything like that. So just an extra layer of protection for him. So as you can see here, it's uh, no big secret as to what I'm doing. It is literally just an all over coat of Chaos Black Spray. Make sure to get all the nooks and crannies, all the, uh, the underneath bits, everything. You want this a complete coat. And from there, we're gonna do our Zenithal Spray of Grey Seer. So this is a downward angled spray like this. And we're trying to catch the entire top of the miniature. We will get basically most of the miniature with a light coat, but it's the uh, the higher points, the bits that are that the sun are going to hit that we're going to aim for uh, with the most of the spray. So you can see me aim for the wings a lot here, around his back, down his tail, top of his head. And I do do a little bit of underspray because obviously I need to get contrast on underneath of his wings, but it's a little bit lighter than on top. As you can see, I'm not trying to achieve a solid coat um, with this spray. Just a nice dusting. Take your time. Lots of finger control. And this is the uh, the phase that will make all the difference in the paint job later on. It's really going to help those contrasts pop um, using the Zenith. So that's just about enough there. Let me bring you in and show you what it looks like. There you go. And still you can see all the black in the recesses, but uh, there's a nice coat ready to work with with the uh, contrast. So now let's get to the painting table. <clears throat> okay, once the, all of his uh, sprays are dry completely, we're gonna move on to paint. First one is gonna be Dark Oath Flesh. And this we're gonna use on all of the parts of the miniature that are skin. So that includes his big tall neck, um, his face, his legs, a lot of his underbody, um, the shoulder parts that connect the body to the wings. There's actually a skin bit there where there's no feather or fur. Um, I'm gonna give you a slight disclaimer for this video now. Um, my rig setting up for painting or filming these videos is not set up for models that are this size. So it was quite an awkward process um, trying to get the model in shot and trying to get it so you guys can see uh, what I'm doing. Um, so there's going to be a lot of funny angles and every now and again um, like this it's it's going to focus on my hand more than it is the miniature I do apologize for that um, but uh, if you follow along you still will get all the tips and tricks you need to get this miniature fully painted of that I promise you so what you want to do is like we've been talking about in a bunch of other videos load up your brush quite heavily with contrast and then start pushing it around the miniature to all the uh, the parts that it needs to go into all those lines and crevices He has such great detail on every part of this model, including the skin. Um, on contrast on it, just really helps to make it pop. Unfortunately, my camera likes the detail on the wings more than the legs, so it's gonna focus in on them. 
But we're gonna jump now and show you what it's like when all of the skin is done on this miniature. So there you go, it's a full coat. As you can see, I went up and down his tail, both legs. There's those little bits under the wings I was talking about, and his face and his neck. So that is the dark oath flesh applied to all the parts that it needs to be applied to. From there, we're going to go onto Gore Grunt of Fur. And this is going to be the first coat across all of the feathers and fur on the miniature. And this is one that you're gonna to have to work quite quickly. Um, quite a heavily loaded brush. As you see, there are large flat areas. You can push contrast around a lot. Long, make sure you pay attention to uh, where it's pooling. Um, and just use your big brush to collect that pooling uh, contrast and then move it up to another part and use it to paint. Um, the reason we want to uh, work fast while using the contrast at this stage is we don't want any part of the contrast to dry before we've got a full coat on the wing. So one of the things that a uh, contrast is, is it's waterproof. What that means that is if you paint an area of a miniature, like half a part of a miniature, and that coat fully dries and you do the other bit, they're not going to blend together. Even if they're the same color, you're going to see this distinctive line between the two colors. So you basically want to get the entire wing covered in contrast before any part of the wing dries. That's a big ask, you just have to work fast. Um, I always find it easiest to get a sloppy coat across the entire wing, and then you go in with a brush and remove any of the excess bits. You don't need to see what I'm doing here. Just take your time and get all the parts that you need to. I'm gonna show you the bits that are going to go that color now. So this is the wing with that color um, all over the fur and feathers parts. I, I cannot express how much I love this miniature. I will definitely be buying a second one to, uh, to do the war boss on one. Now we're gonna move on to Nasdrag Yellow. Uh, this color may change um, for you guys. For me, that's the cloth color of my Cruel Boys army. So all the little like skirts and cloth and hoods that are on my Cruel Boys are all Nasdrag Yellow built up. Um, so this is like the, the, the complementary color for your army. So if your Cruel Boys are red or if your Cruel Boys have blue cloth or whatever, this is where you would then change that color out at this point in the video for this part and make it match in with your army. But for me, it's yellow, so I like Nasdrag yellow as a base coat for that. So I'm going to go in and do it on all the cloth that is underneath his saddle um, and the little cushion on the seat for the uh, shaman to uh, sit on. Once again, here's me trying to make the camera behave itself and focus on the parts that I'm painting as opposed to my hand or the wing or the seat. Or... And there you go, there's the Nasdrag yellow. I used it on his beak as well. That's somewhere that you will be using it for. Quick and dirty. Quite pleased with it so far. Next, we're gonna move over to Saigor Brown, and we're gonna use this for all of the uh, wood parts and the strap parts on this particular miniature. So all the straps that are attaching his armor panels on, um, all the wood for the entire seat, um, and parts like that we are going to do with the Saigor Brown. This is one of my favorite things about contrast is the like main colors, things like browns and stuff. There's quite a lot of different colors, different shades of browns. So even a model like this that's gonna have a lot of browns, you can just break it up with all the different colored contrasts and then pull them all together with a few dry brushes later on. This is a tricky bit here because you wanna get the entire saddle done, but you don't wanna hit that Nasdrag yellow or whatever color you decided to paint your, your cloth with that. Um, Siger brown is quite a dark brown and it will stain things. That's not a huge deal. Like I said, we're going to be layering up that uh, Nasdaq yellow later on so we can fix any mistakes we'll make there. Um, but do your best to be neat. I've also used this to base coat the gnarly old dead tree that he's standing on. Because it's such a dark brown, um, I thought it would be great for that. I'd imagine this tree is in a swamp somewhere. You can see all the uh, kind of algae and growth hanging off of it. It is not a live, vibrant tree. It's very dead and very old. Um, and I'll show you how I managed to achieve that later on. So here it is with all of the Saigor brown parts done, the tree stump, and all of that rigging on his back. As you can see, it's quite a lot. and It goes in and out of everywhere, so be careful. And then all those little straps and stuff that go around the model. Already starting to look like something. 
Okay, now it's time to add that flash of color. So right now this model looks like a traditional bird, um, but we're gonna push it into the Age of Sigmar, that high fantasy style now with a bit of uh, Blood Angels Red. This is a fantastic contrast color. Um, if you look at the box art, they've done the same thing. They have the tips of the feathers done in this red. And in my head at this point, that's what I was going for. I was only going to do kind of the midway down the large feathers down to the tips. Um, as you can see here, I'm missing the top parts. But as I applied this color, I just loved it so much that I decided that all of the flight wings, all of the tall wings or the long wings, sorry, were going to be entirely Blood Angels red. So that's what I'm gonna do. So when it cuts back in a minute, you're gonna see how much red I ended up putting on this miniature. And I really think um, the result at the end was well worth it. And I think it was a good decision just to make them stand out a little bit more. Brown is quite a dull color and to uh, add, a little, add a little bit of flash to the miniature. Um, that's what I've done. Uh, with this, you just wanna be careful not to get any of the other sections of feathers. And this is the point that I realized that I was going to be doing all of the feather. And then we're gonna to jump to here and you're going to see what I did. And I think it was a good decision. I think the wings looked immediately a hundred times more interesting and more exciting. I've done the flight wings on his tail the same and the first layer of his like plumage around his face is done in the red. Um, and all in all, I think it just looks fantastic. I, for one, have gotten extremely used to painting with contrast paints. Um, I, I just love them. Um, they paint super fast. Um, they're super effective. Um, so whenever I have to go to something that isn't contrast, especially for base coats, I just think it takes a million years to do and it starts to drive me nuts. Um, trying a bit of Agros Dunes, which is just like the kind of a little bit like a bone color. I know Skeleton Horde is the bone contrast, but Agros Dunes is close enough. It's a little bit darker, a little bit deader. And I'm just gonna paint this carcass in that color as an undercoat. And then we'll come back to it uh, later on with something else. And this is that uh, orc flesh. And that's literally just for all of the uh, swampy vines hanging down from the trees. Just a little extra detail if we can get out of the way before we get to the wash stage. It's just gonna add so much. Just so quick. In this close-up you can actually see how tall I ended up making the miniature. Three layers of thick cork with sand built up. And this is what I was talking about a minute ago. Now I'm onto the lead belcher basing stage. This is by far the longest and most tedious. So we want to get all of the metallic parts on this big bird done with lead belcher. So he's got a huge armored panel on his chest. He's got the little dangly bit holding onto the head underneath there as well. And then that whole wooden rig on his back has a million little metal kind of rivets on them. Um, I don't even know what you would call those, the metal plates that hold two pieces of wood together. Normally I would know that word, but for some reason it's escaped me. Um, but there's quite a lot there. <laughs> you just want to take your time, go around and get all of those parts. I promise you it's worth it in the end. Okay, so here's what the miniature looks like with all of its base coats on. And by the miniature, I mean just the bird. We're gonna to get to the rider and the banner parts at the end of this video. Don't worry, I'm gonna show you how to paint them up as well. And we're gonna put the whole miniature together in this one video. And there's all those little metal bits I was telling you about. It's quite a lot, but it works. Okay, now we're gonna move on to uh, my favorite stage, which is the wash stage. For this, we're gonna use Rikon Flesh Aid. Obviously that's a skin tone wash, um, but it looks great over uh, browns and it looks fantastic over reds as well. Um, so this is going to be an all over wash. You are going to put Rikon Flesh Shade over every inch of this miniature. You're gonna take your time, make sure you don't miss any bits. And already you can see it adding all that depth. I love it. And just like the contrast, you want to be careful that this doesn't pool in any weird places. You want to see any dark blobs hanging off of feathers or anything. Those are going to stand out a mile. Um, it's not like between a guy's legs or, or like under a jacket or at the end of a gun that you're not going to see it. If it's on the tip of a wing, the model is 90% wing, somebody's going to notice it. So just be super careful. Also try not to fill in all of those little like nips taken out of the feathers. 
Um, they're super cool details. You don't want to fill them in with the shade. I love how it just pulls all the detail out of the face. Up his neck, all that skin. Love it. Okay, so this is the entire miniature all shaded up. As you can see, I was super careful around the wings. There's no big blobs hanging off any of the tips. And the model is fully done. Okay, this is gonna take a while to dry. So what I normally do when the wash stage hits the model and I have to wait for it to dry fully is I tend to get the miniature based. And there you go. <laughs> now the model is based, I can start doing the uh, layering and highlighting stage. So the first thing we're gonna do is a Cadian, uh, Cadian flesh tone. Um, and this is the first driver stage for the skin. So any bits that we hit with that dark oak flesh at the start, we're gonna be dry brushing it with this Cadian tone. Um, just to highlight it up, add a bit of extra detail. You can see how it grabs the, all those ridges in the neck already. The neck bent that way was kind of awkward for the dry brush, but uh, we made it work. <laughs> we go across his face in a minute, and that's super detailed, and it looks great. As you can see, I'm not too worried about what else I'm going to hit. Um, the red is going to get dry brushed another color, and we're going to layer up the beak, so... Not that important. Obviously don't go crazy. And then we're gonna move across to uh, his other side of his face. You can already see all the details jumping out at you. And now the legs. Legs were another slightly awkward one because of the wings. Um, but uh, they've just got such rich detail and the, the dry brush catches them so perfectly. And of course that tail. Not the prettiest tail if you know what I mean, but uh, from a modeling point of view it's stunning. <laughs> it's so well sculpted that doing this kind of technique just grabs everything. Okay, and from here, We're going to move on to Mournfang Brown. This is going to be the first dry brush on all of the brown feather parts that's left over. Just to catch those edges a little bit, add a little bit more brown back into it and cover up a little bit of the staining caused by the shade. It's not going to be uh, hugely obvious, um, but it's a nice little step. For a model like this, that is your uh, focal point of your army usually. This is going to be your centerpiece. Um, it is the model that when someone walks over to your table, has a look at your army, they're going to be looking at this miniature so it's always nice to put in that little bit of extra effort um, and make him stand out so this is just a quick and dirty step as you can see nice bit of dry brushing on the browns of the wings same thing again except this is the red parts of the wings so we've chosen evil sun scarlet which is a nice bright vibrant red um, we just want to bring some life back into the uh the color of the model with that red and as you can see i'm just trying to catch the edges all those little nips taken out that I was talking about earlier, they catch the red dry brush so perfectly. As I said, I love this model so much, I'm planning on getting a second one. And the insane part of me wants to paint the other one like uh, Hedwig from Harry Potter, a white snowy owl color, which I don't know whether that's a good idea or a terrible idea, but stay tuned for results so there's a difference in the wings this is one of those times when i just couldn't get the angle right to, to show you guys the difference of that dry brush um, it was a pain uh, so i had to move the angle and there you have it so there's one side dry brush and one side not and you can see how the difference it makes already uh, for making that model pop i'll show you across the uh, the tail because it's a little bit easier to film the tail <laughs> Such lovely details. It's almost like the, the model is designed to have those kind of two different tones where all the, the feathers break so perfectly to do the two-tone scheme. 
going to go a little bit further again with the Wild Rider Red. This is touching off of like the orange spectrum. Um, and this is going to look great. Once again, just adding that little extra touch. We're going to go a lot lighter on this dry brush than we did with the Evil Sun Scarlet. This is just supposed to grab the tips. As you see, I'm not going heavy. I'm not trying to get an all over coat, nothing like that. Just like that. Catching some edges. I think it did the job. I think the wings are looking well. And then we're going to move on to Flayed One Flesh. And that dry brush is actually going to go over most of the other parts. In fact, every part of the model is going to get a Flayed One Flesh dry brush. And I know what you're thinking. You're crazy. What are you doing? But just keep watching, see the results, see what it does to the miniature. I always think it acts like that final highlight. Um, everyone's always talking about taking the uh, highlight to the extreme. Um, I think that's what this does. Don't worry, the bit across the top of the wing there isn't actually fake on flesh. It's just the camera <laughs> or the light above the camera making it look like I've done it entirely bone. I have not. I love how it looks. There it is without it. Oops. And this is going to go all over the skin, all over the red cloth, all over the wood, literally every part of the miniature, except for the metallics. But you're going to hit the metallics anyway, and we're going to touch them up again in the layering stage, so don't be panicking. You can see really clearly how I do it on the tail. Like I said, the tail is a brilliant bit to photograph because you can literally see skin, meet brown, meet red, and how the bone dry brush actually pulls it all together. Like I said, this model was an absolute nightmare to have in frame while I was recording. Um, the light above is making the bone seem a lot brighter than it is on the top. Um, but yeah, we went to the Balor Brown. This we're going to use to layer up all of the Nasdreg yellow, all of the cloth on mine, plus the beak. So it's probably going to be just the beak on yours, unless you've gone for the same scheme as me. Which you're, of course, more than welcome to do. This is all about leaving that beautiful skin on his face. And just doing the beak parts. And leaving a little bit of that previous colour there for the... Uh, the shading. What we're trying to do is highlight here. Take your time with this bit. This is another one of those focal parts that people will be looking at when they're holding a miniature. There we have it. That's roughly at one half of my beak will look like. And we're also going to do his lovely talons at the same time. Just touch them up with a bit of Balo Brown. Now we're going to move over to the Ushapti bone. For this we're going to go over the talons again, leaving a little bit of the Balor brown um, kind of close to the skin parts, just as a nice little highlight. Got to have those razor sharp talons. Starting to get there now. Now onto the lead belcher. That's for touching up all of those bits again. We're gonna highlight um, all of the metallics on the miniature. As you can see, we've darkened down quite a lot with that shade. The silver parts are the only parts that I wish I could not hit with that shade. I wish I could use a different shade for it, but it still works. Um, I think it's more time and effort than it's worth to actually put a different shade on it. While we're doing the entire model with the Rygon Flesh Shade, might as well throw it on. And then, like I said, once I layer it up here, um, it still works. If you could see that, possibly, but once again, 
as you can see I'm just trying to catch the edges this isn't supposed to be a, a clean uh, paint job it's, it's a ramshackle orc saddle um, all riveted together with uh, whatever bits of scrap they could find so not looking for nice neat, nice, neat lines or perfect um, edges just a bit of rough highlighting okay now we are going to start do some work on the riders so the first thing we want to do is get to work on their skin so we're going to use plague bear flesh and just hit the uh, orcs skin this is the same scheme that i use for my actual cruel boys um, i will get a quick short video on how to do a simple cruel boy boy um fill in the next couple of weeks and throw on the channel so you can see how quickly i do the uh, the standard infantry for this army this guy being a boss i'm gonna take my time and i hopefully make him look pretty nice He is a really cool model. Uh, one of the things you might notice here is that his feet are not on the miniature. The feet are already on the vulture. Um, so I've already done a couple of layers of just the feet. And then when I glue them on later on, they don't match at all. So I just do the last layer um, on his skin again and blend the foot and his ankles back together. And you don't even notice that they were separate parts. This is a super cool model. He has the same kind of skull backpack as the shaman from the dominion box it has um, so it's a really cool um, kind of detail they both share now we're on to the nasdreg yellow that's the same color we use for the cloth like i said that is the army wide color for my guys so if you ever see uh, yellow cruel boys on the table that that's me and we're going to go over all of the cloth on uh, the miniature and some of the banner parts um on the back banner and the little grot. I love how Nasdra Yellow goes on. Like, I'm arguing as to whether it is my favorite contrast. Um, a lot of my friends would say, yes, it is my favorite contrast and I use it every chance I get, but it's hard to argue with the results you get. I think it's absolutely stunning. I mean, that's one coat you're looking at. That kind of yellow detail with one coat is just criminal. Okay, now we're gonna do the uh, back banner parts and the little grot. So there's four hanging banners here, and I've decided to do two of them in the yellow colors, denoting the my army colors. And then I'm gonna do two of the banners in like a turquoisey, greeny, blue color. Um, and if you know the backstory of this miniature, he, he basically knows how to speak every language through some crazy, chaos or destruction worship he knows how to speak every language um, so he's the only thing in age of sigma that can speak to and communicate with kragnos so kragnos kind of sees him as his like right hand man he's the one who's going to issue the orders for kragnos so to denote that um kragnos is a lot of teal and a lot of turquoise in his scheme so i'm going to do two of the banners for the model in that uh, turquoise scheme later on you're going to see that um, and that's that's why so he ties in with kragnos in my destruction force so next one, I'm going to go Gorgon to Fur, and this is the color we're going to use for all of the straps um, on these models. So all of the buckles and uh, the twine and stuff that holds the skull on his back, for instance, and holds the little trousers up. He's got his belt of it. Um, we're going to use it for the uh, shaft of his staff. And you got to be careful with this. This wood stain the Nasdaq yellow. Not too big a deal. Like I said, we're going to be layering it up, layer it on with Balor Brown so we can fix any of those mistakes, but... If you don't have to, it makes the layering process a little bit easier. I know that this video is quite a lot longer than uh, my previous videos. Um, I think my longest previous video was kind of 16 minutes or whatever. This is gonna be nearly 50 minutes of a video. And this is the largest miniature I've painted on this channel so far. So I do hope you're following along, um, finding helpful bits the whole way through um, and are going to be able to uh, get your own Cool Boys Vulture painted up um, on the table quite quickly and you're really happy with the results. Love this model. So we're still on the Gorgon to Fur and we're going to do all the wooden parts on the, uh, 
the little grot guy as well. So all the wood that holds up the banner and the banner pole and all those bits. And there we have it. That is the coat of brown done. And this is the Terradon turquoise. This is that color that is uh, going to denote that the, even though this guy is the boss of my entire army, he respects Kragnos. He's gonna, he's gonna have Kragnos' colors um, flown um, across his back just so he knows uh, his allegiance. Or maybe it's so everyone else knows his allegiance. Don't mess with me. Kragnos has got my back. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I really liked how the uh, it turned out in the end. I thought it was a nice choice. Um, added an extra little bit of flair. like the red and the wings of the bird. The turquoise really added something to this miniature. It's also useful because it blends in with the uh, load of chained hand that he has on the end of his staff. It's how he's such a powerful psyker is he actually managed to take the hand off of a uh, load of change and has used that to uh, channel all his magic wuju. I do actually think that the yellow and turquoise beside each other uh, worked in the back of my head and I was kind of like, hmm, this could be useful for a few other projects. I must keep this in mind. Things like harlequins jumped into my head. Those crazy circus clowns would look good in a variety of mad colors. I'm trying to get a nice thick coat on it because we want to catch all of the the designs and patterns in the in the flag we want the uh, contrast to sell into all of those and there we have all of the turquoise bits done helps pull those two miniatures together i've also done all of the little metallic parts on the wizard um, he has a lot of armor that matches the the shield and the the big hammer of Kragnos. So I've done them in the same teal color scheme um, to match in with him. Like he's found old relics of his time and he's once again showing his respect to Kragnos by wearing them. We're now going to jump onto Skeleton Horde. And this is of course for the giant skull on his back. What this was in a previous life, I have no idea. Maybe one day we'll get a miniature of uh, whatever this skull belongs to. I wouldn't mind unless you guys have any ideas on what kind of skull it is i have i'm at a loss as to what it belongs to so if any of you guys do figure it out know what this skull is off um drop in the comments below i would love to know that's going to start a debate isn't it there we go one color contrast look how good that bone looks so we're going to use this for all of the like burlap sacks across the uh the back of them um, he also has like little turnips uh, hanging off him and lots of little fruits and stuff so I basically just use this to block in a bunch of different colors so there's like the onions or turnips or whatever they are I've blocked them in with the same color the skeleton horde there's a little tooth necklace same color I promise it'll all pull apart at the end when I add in a few extra colors and a dry brush at the back part this actually like horde of parts I thought was going to be the you know, most annoying part of this miniature to paint when I when I was looking at it in Spiro, I was like oh it's going to be so tedious um, I actually thoroughly enjoyed it and when it was done it was actually one of my favorite parts uh, of the model it's something I hadn't really seen on any of the boxes or stuff like that uh, any pictures they showed on community there also appears to be a, a mandrake root from Harry Potter in his hand little uh, screaming turnip creature held firmly in the grot's uh, grip so I painted him the same as well he's actually kind of adorable he's got his little hands crossed and stuff you can see him there next to my thumb there he is <laughs> think in his rules he does actually have some sort of scream rule which hurts the enemy and in my head for the rest of time I'm going to pretend it's a mandrake root that's screeching at them oh, you never know Harry Potter could be in one of the realms go around all the straps that are holding that bottle on I know this is a long stage, but take your time. Make sure you get all of the bits. It's going to be a pain to go back to you later on.
Now we're going to move over to orc flesh. And this is just for the little uh, leafy parts of those vegetables. So the, uh, the mandrake root is getting his uh, hair done. A bit of orc flesh, make it bright and vibrant. Like I was talking about with the browns before, there's so many different green contrasts as well. That you can do so many different colors, it's great. Looks like a mandrake root now. Look at him, all oh, chuffed. And then these the uh, leafy bits from the top of the spring onion or turnip or whatever the hell they are. Get them nice and green as well. Details starting to come together on the back of that miniature. And then I drop them. <laughs> Typical. Fire Slayer Flesh. We're going to use this on any of the decapitated heads or hands or any of the other bits in the model. So he's got a decapitated wizard on, on the top of his banner pole. It looks like one off the like Celestial Hurricane. It's wearing one of those like Empire hat thingies. Um, and then he's got his hands. And the hands are really cool. They're like bound in like different directions so it's almost like they're throwing up gang signs or whatever but it's obviously some sort of i don't know magical effect a bit of dr strange work going on um, but they're done in different uh symbols so maybe the wizard's hands retain a bit of his old magic which is quite a grim thought that his head and hands are being used to just as little magical trinkets another severed hand further down from what wizard that one's from i do not know Blood Angels Red, this is just a really quick uh, little touch and it's for the, you may not have noticed them, you may have noticed them on the back, but they've got little mushrooms. Never think of mushrooms, like Mario jumps into my head, so I like to do them red. And they're fantastical and fantasy and I think they really stand out, so why not? A few red uh, mushrooms. You can see I've already done the stock for that same skeleton horde and I was doing the rest, so as soon as you do the red, they're almost painted. Now goes purple. There for those little jars um, or flasks. I'd imagine they're holding some sort of crazy magical liquid. And all I do is uh, fill in the gaps in between the rope um, with the Nagos purple. A little, a little bit too light there. I load up the brush again and go again. There is one of these jars on the actual shaman and on his back. So you have to do this process twice. Um, but it works. It was quick and dirty to do the skeleton horde on the flasks to catch all the rope bits and then paint in the, the inner bits with the Magos purple. That made it extremely quick to do. So much easier to show everything on this side with the curving with the light. Quick and dirty, but it works. And lead belcher, just like the bird. This is for all the metallic parts. So all those nails coming out of the top of that skull on its back. All the bits that are holding up all the trinkets and bits for the shaman staff. You can see that other jar there now, same thing, Mako's purple dot. And there's all those little trinkets I was telling you about hanging down there in the turquoise color. Those are the parts that match the same aesthetic as parts of Kragnos' armor. So I think they're old um, tr trinkets or whatever from his time. Maybe they're bits of, that have broken off his armor since and you know he's had his order to collect them uh, and worship them as relics of Kragnos. Um, and for all you know they are, maybe they are imbued with some of Kragnos' magic. He was a very old being. under now and get the underneath of those nails without hitting anything else time to be careful
bit of retributor armor gold. Um, this is the tiniest bit of detail on the Lord of Change's hand. If you've all seen the Lord of Change, they've uh, lots of auspicious detail. So yeah, I just did the little armored fingertip that he has in gold and the uh, band that goes around his wrist. Um, I did that in gold as well. Just so it feels a little bit more Lord of Changey. With that, the base coats of these miniatures are done and it's time to shade them all down. So if you follow along to most of my videos, you know I'm a huge fan of all over shades to tie all the colors together and then I layer up from there. So we're gonna apply Seraphim Sepia to this entire miniature. Lots of people have asked me what is my fascination with Sepia. I just think it's a really, really nice tone. Um, I know a lot of people are fascinated with Agrax Earthshade, um, obsessed by it. Um, I just think it's too brown. I think it uh, shades everything really, really dark. Um, I much prefer this like bright yellowy brown color. Um, I just find it a better place to layer up from. And all you gotta do is take your time, make sure you get into all the nooks and crannies, especially on his back, all those little trinkets we were talking about. Um, you want them to all be washed in with the sepia. There's his back done. Look at all those details now, they look so cool. This is one of those parts where I was like, the, the contrast and shade really have done themselves. I look at it and think, wow, a lot of work went into that, but it really didn't. And there's him shaded. Look what it did to the skeleton horde over the skull. Even the yellow, it just contrasts that so well. Okay, now we're on to the layering stage. You see the little mandrake root there in his hand. I don't know what it's actually called in Age of Sigmar. It'll be called a mandrake root for the rest of time in my head. So Elysian Green is what we're going to use to layer up the skin. This is that same color I was talking about later on that I go back to when I glued all of the parts of this miniature together as one for the first time and his feet didn't match his ankles. I use this color to go back over it um, and blend the uh, ankle and foot together. So I'm just going to be super careful highlighting uh, his face, tip of his nose, forehead, cheekbones, just the higher ups, nothing crazy. Put a bit of medicine life back into his skin. I don't know about you, but I presume you guys can see around my film to what I'm painting, yeah? Because I sure can't. There's little knobbly knees. Bulging biceps. Any bits that the light's going to hit. And of course, we're going to do the same to the uh, the boss himself, that shaman. He's got that distinctive chin. Looks like Rocky Balboa. Remove a bit of paint. I thought there was a bit too much to be going in on his nose and stuff there. I thought I'd be filming in detail. So I removed a bit on my thumb and then went in with the very tip of my brush. Just catching all of those raised bits. Like I said, if you're painting a normal crew boy, I wouldn't be doing anywhere near this level of detail because this guy's the boss. He's the main man. You want to put that little bit of extra effort into him. Back onto the Balor Brown. This time we're going to be layering up his cloth and the cloth on the banner. So there we go. As you can see there, I missed a bit of where the shade pooled at the end of that second strip of fabric. So there's that really dark pool. So like I was saying, mistakes like this happen. That's, luckily we're going into the layering stage, the bottle brown, and we can fix and cover up any of that with, the, with that stage. 
you want to be quite rough with this uh, layer like this this cloth is not silk or satin it's it's an old dyed burlap sack that I'm sure he's just draped over himself um, so you're not looking for really clean neat lines you're looking for like a scratchy texture almost uh, we'll be doing another light dry brush over the miniature in a minute and that will really catch the edges and make the highlights stand out so don't be too worried about what you do here And just like I said with the bird, the Nasdaq yellow on this part, you could be painting this blue or purple or whatever color your cool boys are. Um, but all you have to do is substitute the contrast in the layer. The dry brush I do in a minute um, is going to be a bone one. Um, and you can do that over most colors and it, it's going to look fantastic and pull all the colors together. Have a light green. This is to layer up the, well, quite obvious what you're going to be layering up with the Cabalite -like green on this miniature. Um, Kragnos's banners, the heraldry of Kragnos. I don't know what I'm going to call them yet. But just follow those folds in the cloth, um, layer, layer in a downward motion. Um, I'm just going to add that extra spattering of color. Another thing you can tell me in the comments below. I think the two colors are fantastic together. I think it worked really well. Do you think it worked really well or do you think I made a mistake? There's one half of one banner layered up and you can see the deep difference. I punched the wizard over, but that's okay. He's a tough old brute. Here comes that Ushapti bone dry brush I was talking about. This is going to be pretty much, once again, an all-over dry brush on these miniatures. It's going to catch all of that fabric fantastically, all of the wood, all those burlap sacks, everything. And it's going to help them all tie in together. And look at it catching all the edges of the fabric already. Look at one set of flags to the other in like five seconds. You see, it's not changing the colors. It's not taking anything away. It's just adding that bright end highlight to the colors. I think it makes it look like I spent a whole heap of time doing this one. I really didn't. Sorry, once again, the uh, camera decided to not focus there. Go over, over all of the bits, the mandrakes. Little goblin, even great on the skin of the goblin. That last tip of his nose, cheek, that kind of thing. Bit of bone, looks great. Flip them over, look at the dull side. All the colors sitting there a little bit flat. Start adding in that bone dry brush. Sorry, the camera really isn't cooperating at this stage. Like I said, because we're dry brushing this, like when we go over that, uh, that kind of magical pot part, it's just going to catch all of the strings. It's not going to change the color of the purple, um, but it's just going to highlight everything. And you can see me putting an all over dry brush on those colors, all those different colors together. And I don't think it's taking away from anything i think it just adds to it i think they all look highlighted um, they all look fantastic same with this guy as you can see when i layered up the yellow it looks kind of flat kind of dull give the uh, old bone a slight dry brush over the tip of it catches the edge of that yellow the skull like look at the halves composite side there's a side not dry brushed side dry brushed i think that difference is staggering like there's any bit you can take away from it to trust my dry brushes. Look at that. Look at the difference. Continue on, do the rest of the miniature with the nice dry brush.
be more than happy to put that on a table. Good dull and flat the uh, front looks and then the back. So let's add to it. I do apologize. I, I think it might be the dry brush in the camera is trying to focus on different things too quickly. And I really didn't like that fast back and forth motion. And then onto the lead belcher for the uh, picking of the silver bits. This is the only bit that the bone dry brush hurts um, is the metallics. They, it obviously doesn't look right with the bone hitting the tips of them all. But you go back over really quickly. Like this is real time. As you can see, I'm just stabbing a bit of silver back onto the metallic parts. It takes about a minute to do across the entire miniature. That includes the big vulture. Just touch-ups. Those little pots back around the rim of the ladle. A little knife sticking out. And there we have it. So those are the three components of the miniature, all finished painted, all separate. I'm now going to combine all these parts and then show you the, uh, the finished result. Normally I have a, a nice rotating plate for this, but uh, it just doesn't fit with the angle. So the old crude hand turn is what you guys will have to put up with. And there it is with all the components of the miniature put together. I think it looks great. <laughs> It's such a cool model. I'm super pleased with how it turned out. Um, like it did take about maybe three hours of paint time, but I think it was well worth it. Okay guys, I'm calling that video a success. I'm extremely pleased with how the Vulture turned out. Um, I really hope that you guys are as well. Um, if this video makes one person um, who at the beginning of the video thought, I'm not going to get that model, I won't be able to do it, to I'm now going to go out and pick up that model and give it a try for myself. Um, if I've given any one person the confidence to do that, I'm going to call that video a success. Um, thank you guys very much for watching. Um, if you enjoyed the video, if you enjoyed what I do, please think about supporting the channel and subscribe. Um, if you have any questions, please leave a comment below. I do my very best to get back to absolutely every one of you. Um, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye. Remember guys, the plan is simple. We paint them all.